This is Mario Andretti, and you're listening to Fascination Street Podcast. I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with Richard Stanley. Richard Stanley is the author of two books. The first one is called Up on Game, From Robbing Banks to Stacking Bitcoin. And the second is called Up on Game, When I Ruled the World. Richard Stanley, you heard it in the title of the first book, is a convicted bank robber, having been convicted for robbing 13 banks in California. In this episode, we talk about what got him into robbing banks. And from that, we talk a little bit about his time in prison. And then once he got out of prison, how he reformed himself or rehabilitated himself so that he wasn't going to go back to prison. This episode is a lot more fun than I thought it would be. It is more humorous than I ever could have imagined. And you hear him say it at the very end of the episode. He has to come back just to tell the rest of the stories and answer all the questions that I didn't get to ask. This is very engaging. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. And this is my conversation with convicted bank robber and two-time author Richard Stanley. Well, welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Richard Stanley. How are you doing today, man? So far, so good. Thank you for having me on. Oh, dude, it is my pleasure. I have wanted to have you on pretty much since the first time I heard about you from the lovely lips of Mike Dawson. Yeah. We're going to get to all that later. But first, Richard, what I like to do is I like to start off with where people were born and raised. It kind of helps us understand how they got from where they were to where they are. So if you don't mind, man, where were you born and raised? Where'd you grow up? I was actually born in Virginia, but I was raised in California since I was about three years old. So uh, Southern California. So that's that's pretty much all I know. Well, new. Now I'm in East Tennessee. Where in Southern California ish? It was in San Diego, South San Diego, a neighborhood called Otay. It's about a few miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. Oh, okay, cool. I normally don't ask this, but because of your complexion and your accent, I'm going to ask you, are you half Hispanic, half white? Is that how that works? No, I'm white, but I was raised by uh, my mom got with a Mexican immigrant when I was pretty young. Okay. So he raised me since I was, you know, some single digit number or another. And uh, I picked up the accent because of where I grew up and having him in the household, you know, so I have that unique accent. (laughs) So stepdad and he was around since you were itty bitty. Uh, Yeah, about eight years old, I'd say. Oh, cool. This is going to sound weird, but what did you want to be when you grew up? When I was younger, I I think my dream job was an architect because I was always into a drawing architect or a pet shop owner (laughs) because I'm an animal lover. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was one or the other and neither panned out. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's still time. You could still be a pet store guy. Why did you move to East Tennessee? I just got here uh, the last couple of days of September I left because pretty much I saw California, in my opinion, was going to shit. So when we were looking around for a new place, we basically said, uh, and when I say we, I mean me and my wife, Tennessee, Florida, Texas, Arizona were pretty much all places I was looking at, you know, so it ended up being East Tennessee where we settled. Gotcha. So suffice it to say you left for um, reasons relating to politics. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well... Normally, I don't get to the meat this early, but bro. (laughs) Oh, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Stanley is the author of a book called Up on Game. Up on Game from Robbing Banks to Stacking Bitcoin. And then I have a second memoir out called Up on Game When I Ruled the World. And that one is out as well? Yes. All right, cool. So first of all, what the fuck does Up on Game mean? Basically, to be enlightened, to have knowledge of the subject, you know, so basically up on game is me trying to enlighten people to that criminal world, basically. All right. 
I heard you say once, quote, I haven't stolen a car since 2002. (laughs) (laughs) That's a hilarious quote. You should put that on the back of one of your uh, book covers, book jackets. (laughs) (laughs) This is such a weird phrase for me to say, Mm -hmm. but what got you into robbing banks? Well, I'd always wanted to rob a bank since I was like a little kid, but that was because I was already into like petty theft and shoplifting since I was real young. Was this all behind your parents' back? I have to Oh, definitely, yes. My mom's a federal agent. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. And she had been since I was real young. I, I think she became a federal agent in 1991. And my dad, he was a Mexican immigrant. And he worked hard for everything, you know, everything. So to be thieving or anything like that was definitely not something that they would approve of. Yeah. So everything was definitely behind their back without their knowledge or else I'm sure they would have let me have it, you know. So you're just running around with a bunch of kids getting into trouble when you're growing up? I mean, I would go to school. I I would actually rarely skip school. It, it did happen occasionally, but I wasn't one of those people who would be religiously truant or anything like that. Sure. I would actually show up, but the neighborhood I grew up in, Otai, was pretty rough, you know? So in my opinion, I didn't really have too much time or ability to focus on that schoolwork because I was more focused on just surviving my surroundings Just getting to school every day, whether it be walking or taking the bus, you would, I'd say, daily run into gang members or people they'd call tag bangers, which were basically gang members, but they just had more like a crew. And you were constantly getting asked, you know, hey, where are you from? If you weren't affiliated with anybody like I wasn't in my younger years, then you became a target. Easy pickings. You'd get asked where you're from, and then if you responded nowhere, well, now they figure, okay, you don't have any of that backup that I got to worry about by fucking with you. So I would take weapons to school like every day on the walk, on the bus, just to kind of help myself out. How did that work out? Like, did you just show your weapon or pull your weapon? What kind of weapon was it? Are you allowed to say what kind of weapon it was? <laughs> no, it would it would vary. Uh, pocket knives. I'd have these like little miniature hammers. Rarely did I ever actually have to pull those out, though, now that I think about it, because I would always pretend like I had a gun. More so on the walks to school, you would have a carload of people pull up on you again regularly. They'd start asking you, hey, where are you from? And you could kind of see what's about to come. So instead of trying to run, I would put my hand behind my back like I had something and then I'd start to approach the car full of people and it usually worked. You know, they would automatically assume this guy wouldn't be reaching and approaching the car with such confidence unless he actually had something. And that actually never failed for me, although it could have. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, that could have ended pretty badly. Yeah, yeah. But it worked out. That's some forward thinking on your part as a little kid, man, like to just act as if. Yeah. Well, back then in my neighborhood, it it was actually pretty easy to get guns. So it it was pretty common. Like when I was 15 years old, I could have got you a brand new Russian AK-47. Like no problem. You know? Wow. How how much would something like that cost back then? The Russian AKs, if I remember right, was something like 800 bucks back then. That's it? Yeah. Yeah. But the bullets were 50 bucks each. So that's where they got you. (laughs) <laughs> wow, that's insane. Uh, that's like uh, when they give you a cell phone for free, but they charge you for minutes. Yeah, exactly. Day. Yeah, like when <laughs> texting first came out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy Lord. I'm I'm just going to assume that this was not the greatest neighborhood since you had to walk through a veritable minefield on the way to and from school. What did your parents think it was going to be like in living in that neighborhood? I don't think they saw it coming. And, and honestly, um, My mom, she'd get up early for work, early in the morning, like, say, 5 a.m. and head out the door at 6. My dad was a truck driver, so he'd leave even earlier, you know, like 4 a.m. And he'd be back at, like, 8 p.m. at night. He was just always working. My mom did 16-hour shifts, too, pretty frequently. They didn't really get to see it, you know. Uh, Occasionally, they would get hints, like our cars being stolen. I think that happened, like, three times over, you know, the course of us living there. But they didn't really get to see the gang members all walking around in crowds because it was common to see. You would just see eight to ten, you know, gang members just mobbing together, patrolling the streets. But that would be during the hours when they're at work. 
That makes sense, right? Gangbangers are probably not notorious for being up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, or if they are, they're stealing the cars and stuff like that. <laughs> so you did a bunch of things. You did some crimes. You stole a car, probably more than one, but the last one was in 2002. <laughs> yeah. Because then did you did you graduate to some other things? Or was 2002 the last time you stole a car? Because that's when you got arrested. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the last car I stole would have been a day or two before the last bank I robbed, because initially it started off with just stealing cars. And then we would like sell them for their parts, you know, the seats, the rims, the stereo systems and whatnot. And again, Otai was pretty rough. So so you could actually comfortably just pull up into a, some apartment surface parking and just drop that thing on cinder blocks right there in a parking space. And no one would call the cops. They were afraid of the gang members. So we would steal the car from outside of our neighborhood so it wouldn't be on the local PD's hot list. And then we would strip it out in our neighborhood. And then eventually it graduated to uh, robbing banks. And then since I already knew how to steal the cars, I would just use the stolen cars as a getaway car. Okay. Now this is call me crazy, but you're stealing cars and robbing banks and the word bank has a, an S at the end, which means you robbed more than one. Yeah. We're going to get to how many that we're allowed to admit to later. <laughs> but you're stealing cars and presumably other things. Were you not worried about fingerprints? Did you wear gloves? How did that happen? What are you wearing on your hands? When you grow up in or around the gang culture, that's pretty much the majority of the knowledge that the older ones pass on to the younger ones is, is how to do crime, how to be better at crime. Uh, maybe the older ones have already been to prison and learned from their mistakes or spoken to others and then learned from theirs. And then they pass that knowledge on to the younger generation. So never had to worry about fingerprints. We would always have gloves on, make sure that you never took them off during the process of actually stealing the car or, or while riding around in it. So we were pretty hip to that. Even when you were stealing cars, you were wearing gloves? Yes. Oh, cool. What kind of gloves? Like leather gloves or? You know those Franklin baseball gloves? Yeah. Those were the popular ones. Oh, cool. That's uh, This is going to sound really stupid and nobody cares, <laughs> but I use those baseball gloves when I play golf because whenever I use golf gloves, I tear a hole in them before the end of the first game. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty sturdy, and they got a good grip on them, and you can feel pretty good with them. Exactly. That was the key, being able to feel and, and the good grip, because when, when I would steal the car, the way I would steal it was with a, a dent puller that you could get at Home Depot back then. I don't know if they still sell them there. Is that the kind with the screw on the end? Yeah, the screw on the end, and then uh, it has that weight on the shaft. Yeah, that slides back. Yep, and it hits the handle and creates that force. So, yeah, I would screw it into the ignition, and then you use the weight to yank out the ignition, and then you would just put in a screwdriver to get it started. And you, would you also pop the door lock that same way? No, I, I had a center punch that I would use, a spring-activated center punch, and I would pop out the smaller window in the back, and then I'd reach in and unlock it like that. Oh, okay. Or if it was like a ragtop Mustang, I would cut a little triangle in the top, reach in, pop the door open. Either or, either it would have been center punching the little window in the back or cutting through the top and then reaching in. And then you'd use that dent puller to yank out the ignition? Holy yep. shit. Yep. And this is all tricks that you learned from the neighborhood kids? Yep. And then, and then eventually I graduated to master keys. What's that? A master key was good for, like the master key I had was good for Hondas and Acuras between certain years. And it, I think it worked for between the years of like 92 to 96. So you would just put it into the door and kind of jam it in and out, wiggle it, you know, turn it. And then eventually you would see the lock start to flicker. You'd pop it open. And then you do the same thing to the ignition, just kind of sawing motions and twisting at the same time. And then you'll get it going. And then there you go. You got a car. You didn't even have to break no windows or cut nothing. So it doesn't look suspect when you're driving around in it. Interesting. Where did you get a master key? Just from buddies and friends and things? Connections? That one was actually, I met this, well, she ended up being my girlfriend, but she was a mad tweaker. And she had this other tweaker friend and her tweaker friend had the master key. And she told us, yeah, you could use this on Honda's Acuras between this year and this year. And we went to Home Depot and just had the key remade. Holy shit. <laughs> and, That's and then we just had a handful of master keys. Now, your tweaker ex-girlfriend's tweaker friend is going to come in later, right? 
Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> All right, rock on. So you start robbing banks. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that day happens, because I can imagine me and, I don't know, me and my friends sitting around playing video games or whatever the hell we're doing. <laughs> and then one of us says, hey, do you want to rob a bank? I can't imagine a scenario where the rest of the people that I'm playing video games with said, hey, Richard, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Walk me through that. How does that happen? Well, again, it's pretty much because of the environment we were all raised in. I was at my friend's place, technically his mom's place, but, you know, I was over and, and we were in his room and we were playing Halo on Xbox. Our daily routine was basically to get Taco Bell or if it was a Sunday or a Wednesday back then, they had the 29 cent hamburgers and 39 cent cheeseburger days with the bucket of fries at McDonald's. All you can eat wiener schnitzel on Wednesdays, you know, so we were real into that. So we'd go out and steal cars at night. And then we'd basically fuck around during the day. So we were playing Halo and we decided it was time to get something to eat. So we started scraping up the money and we only had like maybe seven dollars between us. And we needed about 10 bucks for the grande meal at Taco Bell and then a two liter of Pepsi or Coke. And again, we only had like seven bucks. So I was frustrated and I, and I just blurted out like, hey, man, we should rob a bank. You know, and my friend just looked at me and he was like, well, fuck it, let's do it. And, and as soon as he agreed, I was like, oh, damn it. <laughs> you know, like I've already committed to this. I can't. I'm going to interrupt you. In your neighborhood, like once you come up with an idea or you say some dumb, hey, do you want to do some crime shit? Mm -hmm. If the person you're with or the people you're with says, yeah, let's do it. And then you back down. That's a problem, right? Because now you look like a puss. Exactly. It's, it's like you're going to try and encourage you know others to do a crime and then when they call you out on it you're going to back down so yeah they they look at it like as a form of weakness and uh you can't be counted on so once you commit to it you got to stick with it so at this point when they're like hey that's a great idea man let's go do that you're like ah shit now i gotta go rob a bank <laughs> yeah well it was one friend at the time that that was there present so yes yeah, as, as soon as he agreed i knew like okay but we already had a stolen car outside that I believe we had stolen either the night before or the night before that. Okay, so that's pretty brazen. Like, you steal a car, you're going to want to flip it and get rid of that shit real quick because it's hot, right? Why is yeah. he just sitting outside for two days? What's wrong well, with you, man? Well, it wasn't sitting outside in, in his, you know, designated parking spot. It was on the side street, you know, so if they found it, it couldn't really be tied to anybody. We were waiting for somebody to come by that day to check out you know, certain pieces, like I said, we'd sell seats or systems or whatever. So he was coming by to check out what he might want from it. So we had that ready to go. And I had, uh, when I was growing up, they had this show called the FBI Files on the Learning Channel. I used to like watching like PBS, the Learning Channel, Discovery, stuff like that. FBI Files, they were real braggy. You know, the detectives that they would interview, the detectives would always be like, yeah, so, you know, we caught this bank robber because he made these mistakes, you know, and they would point out all the holes in that guy's, you know, the whole plan. And that was one of my favorite shows growing up. So I knew we didn't want to use our own car, you know. So you're studying, you're watching how to videos before there was how to videos. Yep. But yeah, I, I had grabbed a piece of paper because I, I figured I, I didn't learn this from the show, but I figured if I take a piece of paper, cut it out about the size of a check. I could put it in my wallet so when I'm in line uh, and I approach the teller and I remove the note it, to everybody else around me, it would look like I was just cashing a check as far as they're concerned. So I cut out a piece of paper the size of a check and in chicken scratch, I wrote my lines. At the top, I wrote smile and then the, the lines were uh, put the money on the counter, no impacts, alarms or tracing devices. There's two more guys outside with guns. Hurry up. This ain't no joke. So now, did you have a gun when you put this note out? No, but I used the line. There's two more guys outside with guns sure. for the implications. Like, of course. Oh, so obviously he has a gun, but I wasn't saying that I did. I sure. thought I was being real clever, real, you know, so that way, if I were to be caught, it wouldn't be too much time in prison because there was no weapons used. There was no me threatening to hurt anybody if they didn't comply so I, I thought I was doing it cleverly. <laughs> Anywho, so I cut the note out, wrote the message on the note, wiped the prints off of the wallet that I had, you know, no prints on anything, just in case the paper wiped that thing down too. 
Hey, streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. So I ran into previous guest of this show, Chris Gronkowski, the other day, and it went a little something like this. Hey, Steve. Hey, Chris. Hey, you know what sucks? When I get done with my workout at the gym, my protein shake's not cold anymore, man. It's room temperature. (laughs) Weird. I haven't run into you at the gym lately. Busted. Okay, truth be told, I don't work out. But I do get thirsty after a long day of podcasting. I just can't seem to keep my cocktails cold. You should use an ice shaker. What's an ice shaker? The ice shaker is a double wall, vacuum insulated, stainless steel shaker bottle with a patented twist and agitator that breaks up the protein powders. So you're saying I should switch to an ice shaker, take out the agitator so I can fit more ice in the cup and it'll stay cold longer? Steve, you don't need more ice. The ice shaker is third party tested and verified to keep your drink cold for 30 plus hours. Chris, you're a genius. I'll still remove the patented screw and agitator and just add more booze. I guess technically you could, but if you actually use the ice shaker as a protein drink cup, the agitator breaks up the powder and doesn't bounce around like you're shaking a paint can. Why are we still talking? Let's party. Gronk style! That's right, Streetwalkers. Ice Shaker is the new sponsor at Fascination Street Podcast. Ice Shaker is made from kitchen-grade stainless steel so it doesn't smell all funky after you use it a couple of times like those cheap plastic ones. When I'm out and about doing interviews or partying Gronk style, I use the Fascination Street Podcast Edition 26-ounce Flex Ice Shaker Cup and it keeps my drink cold until the sun comes up. You saw Ice Shaker on Shark Tank. All five sharks made an offer with Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez closing the deal. Now you can get a deal too. Order your own 26 ounce flex cup right now at iceshaker.com and use the promo code FSP for $5 off your first order. Once again, that's iceshaker.com, promo code FSP, as in Fascination Street Pod, for $5 off your first order. That's iceshaker.com, promo code FSP. Let's get back into it. Tell me the whole note again. I think I might have interrupted you. I had wrote smile at the top with a smiley face. And then I wrote, put the money on the counter. No ink packs, alarms, or tracing devices. There's two more guys outside with guns. Hurry up. This ain't no joke. How did that go the very first time? I have to imagine you uh, were pretty nervous. And this is going to sound super crazy, but... Am I right that the very first time you did this, the teller you approached was super hot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was very attractive. And and now that I'm thinking back, like, I don't remember why I wrote smile at the top of the damn note. I think it was just for whoever the teller may end up being wouldn't look nervous or afraid. It must have been an idea that just popped into my head as I began writing the note. We drove to the bank in the stolen car, which is already stressful enough. Because I didn't like traveling long distances in a stolen car because you always run that risk of being pulled over, perhaps a a pursuit happening. So just the ride over was nerve wracking enough. How far away was the first bank from the house where you're playing Halo? It was probably about 10 miles. Okay. I'd say, yeah, yeah. So it it was a little journey. But before we actually robbed it, we called another friend because one thing I had noticed on that show, I would watch the FBI files, was that you don't want to stay in the stolen car after the bank robbery. Most of the bank robbers that they had caught on the show would rob the bank and then they'd head straight down the main street to the freeway. So the show pretty much let me know that the cops were already expecting that it was part of the plan. So we knew we needed a legit car, which was a registered car, unstolen, you know. So we called up another friend and asked him to come over. We didn't want to explain it to him over the phone. Again, we were real paranoid (laughs) back then being raised by older gang members so that you're always told don't say anything stupid over the phone. So we just told him to head over that we had an opportunity and he did. And then we told him the plan and he was willing to participate immediately. Another 18 year old, you know, that was just ready. So he got in the legit car. We got in the stolen car. He follows the stolen car like right behind us. Right. So that that way, if a cop does pull up, he'll start to swerve intentionally. He'll start to swerve in the legit car because now the cop's going to pull them over and allow the stolen car a chance to just get away. Worst he's going to get is the ticket. Hey, who came up with that idea? That's pretty fucking genius. 
I can't remember exactly who first came up with that idea, but it was one of our little crews. Probably best that you don't use a name anyway. Yeah, yeah. But that's some really cool shit. I mean, they use bait cars on criminals. Why not use a bait car on them? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) So we headed over to the bank like that with the legit car following behind us. And then as soon as we got close, the plan was after we hit the bank, we were going to pull out of the driveway go on to the main street, which there was two main streets right there at that intersection. So we were turning on one of them and the first residential street to the right is where the legit car would be waiting. So after the bank hit, we would go down the main street, take the first right hand turn into the residential area, switch from the stolen car into the legit car, and then take the side streets from there back home. And the legit car would always be a completely different description than the stolen car. Because if you rob a bank in a gray Honda, they're probably going to pull over anyone who looks suspicious in their opinion that is just a gray sedan, you know, or, or something like anything close to it. Because they figure people can mix up the description just a bit anyway. So we headed to the bank. Once we saw the side street that we had previously determined would be the switch off point, the legit car pulled into there. We headed to the bank, reversed into the spot. My friend stayed in the driver's seat and basically his job is to keep a watch on the outside area just in case he sees like police pull up or security running or anybody. He would then call me and let me know, hey, dude, you got to get out of there. Hurry up. So I got out, realized that I had forgot the damn bag for the money. So I started searching around in the car for anything I could find to use. And I found this uh, Carl's Jr. bag, takeout bag. So I took that, crumpled it up, put it in my pocket. I proceeded to walk into the bank. It was one of those bank branches inside the grocery store where there's like three tellers. So that was the first one. First and second were like that, actually. Oh, okay. But I, I walked in and to the left is where the bank tellers were. And I saw that there was a line, you know, and I, I kind of wasn't expecting that much of a line. So I I just got in line and I stood there and I waited behind a bunch of other people. I didn't really put too much thought into the clothing I was wearing. So I looked like a straight up cholo from like the movies, like 187 or colors or something. Like I was a complete bust. (laughs) I wasn't wearing the Franklin baseball gloves, but I was wearing these little black cotton gloves that they would sell at the Dickie outlet stores. Hat, glasses, and again, looking like a complete gang member. So... People were looking, you know, I I was watching them watch me. I was really nervous. It was really hitting me. And then I I would get closer and closer. You know, someone would go up to the teller. They'd finish their business and head out. And then next thing you knew, I was next in line. But I'm watching these people watch me. And I'm like, shit, you know, thinking, should I do it? Should I do it? Or should I just leave and like tell everybody it was a bust, you know? But then I was like, if I do that, my homeboys are going to think I'm a bitch, you know, that I just backed out at the last minute. So I was like, I can't have that, you know. And uh, and then I hear the bank teller say next. And she was talking about me. So <laughs> I walked up to the teller and then I just removed the wallet like I had planned, took the note out. I slid it to her. She separated it because it was kind of bent from being in the wallet with her fingers. And she started reading it. And then she smiled at me, you know, but she was again, she was pretty fucking hot. (laughs) And I forgot that I had wrote fucking smile. So I'm thinking like, damn, this fucking bank tellers into bank robbers, you know, like what are the fucking odds in that? (laughs) But after she finishes reading the note, she's like, do you have a bag or do you need one? That is so sweet. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking like, wow, this is some fucking customer service right here, you know, like friendly, helpful, you know, attractive, you know, I was like, this is awesome. So I told her, no, I have one right here. Thank you. And then uh, she started putting the money on the counter. Again, I learned this one from the FBI files. I knew that ink packs would be in those stacks of money if they're going to be there at all, because they're supposed to follow policy, which is if you ask for no ink packs, alarms, tracing devices, the way I understand it, they're not supposed to give them to you. Because if they do and you discover them and freak out, you might hurt a customer. And then if that all comes out later in trial, now that family member of the customer or the customer themselves, I believe, have action for a lawsuit because the bank chose the value of the money over the value of the life of the customer. But just to be on the safe side, I would tell them put the money on the counter because then you take those stacks and you bend them. And you'd be able to feel the ink pack inside of them if it was there. 
So she started putting the money on the counter. There was no impact present. I started filling the bag up with money. Uh, as soon as she was done giving me the money, I was like, okay, thank you. You know, have a nice day or something like that. And then I started to leave. And about halfway to the door, at first I was casually walking. And then I just said, screw it. And I started running to the car, hopped in. And then he's like, what took so long? <laughs> I was like, you're all I had to give my phone number to this chick. Oh, man, I'm so glad I wasn't that fucking stupid, you know, but I did contemplate asking for hers, you know, because I was <laughs> I was the definition of young and dumb, I suppose. But I decided against it, you know, for the conflict of interest. But uh, I hopped in the car. He said, it took so long, you know, and I was like, there was a fucking line. You know, let's get the hell out of here. So he turns out to the right and then hangs the left to get to the driveway, which will take us to the main street. And then as we're in the driveway about to take a right hand turn, he says, hey, let me see the money. You know, so I reach into the bag and I pull out a clump of money and some like stale fries hanging out of it that have been in the bag previously. <laughs> and, and then we both just had smiles on our faces, you know. And then I told him, I said, hey, when are we going to do this again? And he was like, shit, you tell me. I believe we hit another bank about a week or two after that. Okay. So do you remember how much money you got on that first robbery? Somewhere around the neighborhood of 8000 8500 something like that. Split three ways? Yes, because I, I believed equal risk deserved equal rewards. And that was the way we do it with the car thefts already. Anybody participating would just get an equal share in the take. Sure. Well, that seemed like it went well. How nervous were you? Like how many weeks? Well, it doesn't sound like many. How long were you looking over your shoulder to see uh, what, if anybody was coming? The switch off to the legit car was like perfect. Nobody saw. We made the switch. We drove home to, on the side streets, made it back fairly quickly. While I was in the legit car, I was looking for tracing devices. Didn't find any of those. And then we got back home and we put on the news to kind of see if they were talking about it. And, and they weren't. Like we watched the news for like days, you know, nothing, no, no mention of it, nothing. So we're like, OK, whatever, you know, like, I guess we knew they'd be looking for whoever robbed the bank. But I figured that the hat and glasses disguise was freaking perfect because, yeah, no one had been looking for me or anything like that. And, and I didn't have too much of a criminal record at the time, that, like petty stuff, real petty stuff. So. I suppose maybe if they were looking for anybody that, that had already been in trouble, they were looking for a more serious criminal, you know, someone with a more substantial record. But yeah, they didn't look for us. And more or less, when we decided to rob the next bank, it was because we were already out of money. That's a lot of Taco Bell, man. <laughs> yeah, I was a big fast food fan. <laughs> but I spent most of it on like clothing, you know, a little bit of jewelry, food, and then some hotel. You have to get an outfit where you don't look like a cholo the next time you rob a bank. Yeah, I wasn't that smart. So I just like upgraded my cholo attire. So it just still looked cholo. You're all, I'm a name brand cholo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Instead of it being like the Ben Davis jeans from the Dickie store, it was like, Miller's Outpost pants or Levi's or Tommy Hilfiger, you know, but they were still creased up with the little cuff at the bottom. Sure, of course. You got to come proper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So how many banks did you cop to? How many banks did they say you robbed? Do you like how I worded that? Did I word it correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They accused me of robbing about 13 of them. Gotcha. They uh, charged you with robbing 13 banks. Mm -hmm. Did they charge you with a total dollar amount of monies stolen? I'm sure that's in the legal paperwork somewhere, but I, I never actually saw that figure. So I don't know it. But I know restitution wise, I got hit with like a, a $54,000 bill, but that was for uh, six or eight of the banks. Who do you restitute? The FDIC? No, no, that's the interesting part. I owe it to the California Department of Corrections somehow. Oh, how shocking. How convenient. Yeah, I, I've always wondered about that because I know it's federally insured money, but for some reason or another, it seems like the Department of Corrections kind of took over the debt. So it's, it's really weird. So I only ended up having to pay for like six or eight of the banks and then basically take credit for the rest of them, but I didn't get stuck with the restitution. So, yeah, it wasn't anything crazy. The biggest hit I ever had was like 24000 I believe, from one bank. It was never in the hundreds of thousands for a single bank or anything like that. Sure. 
If it had been on the first one, maybe you wouldn't have. Just kidding. You still would have robbed all them banks. I probably <laughs> would have, yeah, because at the end, I already had a good amount of cash saved up, basically enough to where I didn't need to go rob banks. And at that time, I was taking the bank robbery money, investing it into drugs, and then I'd sell the drugs. Ah, sure. And then you'd basically four or five X your money. Of course. When you got arrested, did they arrest you with any drug charges? Did they hit you with any of that? No. They got my friends for drug charges because they found a safe with money in it that had some drugs in it. And then they found another friend of mine in possession of close to a pound of methamphetamine. Jesus. And I feel bad for that because when they arrested me, I didn't have anything on me. I had like $20, no drugs, but I had recently got this damn storage unit and that's where I had about a pound of meth. So I saw when the FBI agents discovered that envelope for the storage unit and I was like, oh shit, you know? So when I got down to the jail, I called my friend and and in other words, without saying, hey, can you go to that fucking storage unit and get out that pound of meth so I'm not even more fucked? But that's basically what I told him, and he agreed. So he headed over there that same night, and he was actually able to get out the meth. But then he left it in his car, and my tweaker girlfriend at the time, she wasn't arrested with me, but she was detained while she was with me. And they basically asked her a bunch of questions like, hey, who are his friends? Have you heard him talk about anything like this, that, or the other? So they put FBI agents to surveil my close friends. And yeah, they were watching him from about half a mile away up on a hill with binoculars. So he pulled up to his house with that pound of meth in his car. And then they they swooped in on him from there as he was driving away, pulled him over. He got caught with the meth and then he ended up getting charged and convicted for drug possession. With intent to distribute? No, just being in possession or receiving stolen property, however that one goes, for having stolen bank bills on him from the last bank that I had hit. Jesus. Is this guy still incarcerated? No, he got two years for that, two years with half. So he ended up having to serve just under a year. Wow. Just under or just over? Because I think he was in a prison riot while he was there, so he might have caught a little extra time. That sounds fun. (laughs) So were you worried that this dude was going to come after you when he and you both got out? Oh, no, no. He was a close friend. So it's not that he wasn't concerned or or upset about going to prison, but it it was something that I would have been willing to do for him and he would have been willing to do for, you know. So it was just part of the game. Like everybody in our neighborhood ended up going to prison. Well, anybody that was in, in that gang element. So everybody that we would hang out with had already been to prison or been to juvenile hall or been to the California Youth Authority, which is like juvenile prison, where juvenile hall is like the county jail version for the juveniles. So it was it was to be expected that eventually you would go to prison. Oh, sweet. But yeah, so he wasn't too upset with me. How long were you in prison for? Well, how long was your sentence? And then how much time did you do? I ended up signing a deal for six, seven or eight years because they had arrested the wrong person ahead of me. And basically... (laughs) fumbled that one and got him to essentially admit to being at the scene of one of the crimes. And as soon as he did that, they started putting his picture in some photo lineups for the bank tellers. And he looked pretty damn close to my appearance. So they started picking him out as possibly being the robber. So they had charged him with about eight or nine bank robberies and then put his picture in front of all those tellers from all those banks. So they fumbled their case with me for all those first nine banks. And then I kept robbing banks while he was incarcerated and they finally let him go. And then they offered me a deal for six, seven or eight years with two strikes and 85 percent. Wait, 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 what does that mean? Most of my listeners and myself, we're not from California, so we're not familiar with the three strikes rule. So what is two strikes and 85 percent? What does that mean? 85% means you have to serve at least 85% of the sentence that they end up giving you. Okay. And two strikes means you have one more strike left before you get life in prison. And at that point, any new felony conviction was life in prison. So if you get in a fight and you make the other person bleed, and for example, they say you started the fight, 
and you get charged with great bodily injury, you'd get life in prison. If you get caught with marijuana while in prison, any amount, it's a felony, life in prison. If you're on the street and you get caught with, I think at the time it was an ounce or over, it would be a felony. That would be life in prison. So 25 years to life. And again, that's why I say I thought I was being clever with my wording and not using weapons and not trying to scare anybody. But it it turns out that uh, the way the California law is written is it's still a violent felony. (laughs) And instead of just each individual bank being a charge or a strike, it's each teller you rob. Oh, shit. So I ended up robbing 13 banks, they say. And then if you times that by an average of two tellers, you know, it's like 20 something counts of robbery. Because you would get all the money from one teller and then you'd go to the next teller and get their money too? Yeah. As I grew more confident, I started making it a point to choose banks with more tellers working so that I could get more money because I got used to instead of sliding a note, like after the second bank, I would say it all. So I would just walk in and then I I ended up perfecting my lines, trying to say it clear enough. And then I would finish my lines to one teller, move on to the next, repeat the lines, move on to the next, repeat the lines, go back to the first one and collect the money and then bend the stacks as I put it in the bag. Like that time I got the 24 grand, I, I was in and out of there in under a minute. I think it was like 40 something seconds and I had hit multiple tellers. Wow. You should change tires for NASCAR. (laughs) (laughs) hey streetwalkers here's a word from our sponsors it is 2140 you are trapped in an underground bunker built a century ago to protect mankind from the pandemic on the surface now ruled by tyrants and their robot army You are an outcast, an orphan, a scavenger, blind, afraid, and alone. You are Ace, a survivor, and you will try to escape this place, this place known as Subterra. Subscribe to Subterra at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you download podcasts. Let's get back into it. All right. So I promised that your tweaker ex-girlfriend's tweaker friend was going to come back into play. Yeah. How does she play into this wonderful story? Well, I had robbed a bank. If it wasn't that same day, it was the day before. And we got a hotel, which was part of the tradition of ours. I was at the hotel with my tweaker girlfriend uh, at the time. You know, long story short, we had some people over. They left. We ended up going to sleep. I get a call at some odd hour of the night, like 3, 4 a.m., something like that. And it was her other tweaker friend. And she just starts firing off random questions. You know, she's like, hey, where are you at? You know, I'm like right here, you know, and she's like, who are you with? I was like, your friend, you know, and she's like, who else is there? I was like, nobody. And she's like, you know, how long are you going to be there? And so she just starts asking these really strange questions. But I'm thinking she's a tweaker. So this is like standard activity for her. So I'm not even getting suspicious or nothing. As soon as I answer the last question, she's just like, "Okay, bye. And then she hangs up. And I didn't realize the feds had gotten a hold of her and she was helping them find me. And then uh, 6 a.m., a couple few hours later after that phone call, as they were pounding at the door and I and it woke me up to the sound of, you know, like several different people shouting FBI at the same time and pounding on the door. So I, I was startled awake and then I heard it again, pounding again. And then like, you know, several voices, FBI, open up. But yeah, it was thanks to my tweaker girlfriend's tweaker friend, nice. <laughs> you know. As far as them finding me. So the first time that you woke up, were you just like, man, I just had the craziest dream. I was watching the FBI files and they were all (laughs) shouting to open the door. It was weird. (laughs) Well, uh, me and my friend used to joke around with each other, um, you know, after we started robbing banks. So sometimes I'd see him pull up to the surface parking and then I'd go and I'd hide on top of the washer and dryer machine and like close the little doors and I'd wait for him to come inside and get situated and be, you know, assume that I wasn't home. And then 
I jump out of the doors and scream FBI, you know, and startle the shit out of him. Hilarious. And he would do the same thing to me. So, so when I first woke up, I was thinking, is this my fucking friend fucking with me right now? <laughs> but then when I heard it again and I heard it was several different voices and they were really pounding, I was like, oh yeah, no, that's probably actually the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Are you going to rob another bank? No, never. Oh, okay, cool. Just checking. Just checking for all of you FBI and CIA guys who are listening. Uh, right here, you said no. So, <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so why did you write your first book? And tell me the name of it again. Up on Game from Robbing Banks to Stacking Bitcoin. Basically, with the book, I'm trying to speak to people who are still in that criminal element. And I'm trying to tell them my story, you know, so they could see what I've been through the upbringing, the bank robbery, the prison time and show them that I ended up getting out, you know, and I ended up changing and I see the world differently now. And hopefully they can too. I don't think I am a positive influence on like your everyday average kid, you know, let's say that has a mom, dad in the home, like is being raised right. Like I'm no kind of influence to them and I shouldn't be right. More of a cautionary <laughs> tale, I suppose. But to kids that are being raised in the gang life in that element, I think I definitely am a good influence for them because they can see like you, you don't have to put yourself through all that to see that there's another way, you know, that there's another way out that you can view the world differently. It doesn't have to all be like gangster life stuff that the older homies are pumping into the kids brains, you know. You can do right. You can get a job. You can invest. You can get out and you don't have to like snitch on anybody because I never did. I never told on any of my friends, co-defendants, none of that. That's why they ended up getting so little prison time. One got two years with half. One got 16 months with half. And then I ended up getting the eight years with two strikes and 85 percent because I kept my mouth shut. Same thing through prison. I went all through prison. I never told on nobody. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to show them that you can change, you can get out of the game and you don't have to be a snitch. You don't have to be a dropout. Basically, all those things that those kids or current, you know, older gang members are concerned about, you know, that maybe they want to get out of the game, but they don't want to be viewed as a dropout or a snitch or, you know, rat or anything like that. So I wanted to show them that there's other ways to get out just by viewing things differently, you know, accepting the fact that a career in crime isn't the way to go because it just ends up in pain. That's what I'm hoping the readers would take from the book. And then anybody else who's not in that element, hopefully they just enjoy the ride and the story. <laughs> sure. It sounds fascinating as shit. All right. Listeners of my show will know that if you call my personal cell phone, you will not hear my voice if you get my voicemail, but you will hear the dulcet tones of Mike Dawson. And I bring that up because Mike Dawson did the audiobook for your first book, right? Yep, sure did. Now, in the title of your first book, which has, I think, 300 words in the title, <laughs> the last part is stacking Bitcoin. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. There's not too much Bitcoin talk in the book. I pretty much just get into how I discovered Bitcoin and the opportunity I saw in it. What happened was when I got out of prison, I became a union iron worker. That was the first job I could find. What year was this ish? I got the union iron worker job in January of 2010. I had got out of prison in like towards the end of October 2009. Was searching for a job immediately, like Carl's Jr., Jack in the Box, fucking stocking shit at Target. But you would have to put if you had felonies. And then they would, you know, ask you to expand, like, exactly which felonies. And I'd, I'd have to put conspiracy, robbery, burglary. So <laughs> no one wanted me working the fucking register, you know, and I get what? it. Why not? That's crazy. Yeah, I know. That's what I thought. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I couldn't find a job. And, and then luckily a, a family friend was able to get me into the Union Iron Workers 433. He told me, he's like, it's hard work. You know, it's hard work, just so you know. I was like, man, I don't care. I'll take anything I can get. So I did iron working for about two and a half years or so until I had a pre-existing back injury from running from the cops when I was like 15. I mean, who doesn't? I, <laughs> I got away that time, but I hurt my back pretty bad. And it turned out it was a herniated disc, but I didn't find that out till years later. So I took the iron working job with a herniated disc and 
2010 to 2012 was still pretty recession ravaged, you know? So you'd be on the job site and you would have dozens of people lined up outside the job site along the fence line with their tools ready to work. And they were just waiting for somebody to get fired, injured, so that they could fill that spot immediately. For real? Yeah. That's the kind of shit you see in movies. Yeah, from the Depression. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was just like that. I actually went to a job in Orange County one time that because it had so many different trades that were actively working on the on the project, there was hundreds of people outside from all, you know, all different trades making up that pile of hundreds of people. But it was freaking crazy. So that's how hard it was to get work. Whenever a job ended, you would go driving and you would look for cranes wherever the cranes were. That's where the work's at for the iron workers anyway. So so you would find a crane, you, you'd exit, try and hunt the job site down, you'd pull over and then you'd go up with your tools. You'd be like, hey, do you guys need anybody? You know, I can do this, that, I could weld, you know, like all that stuff. And then you would hope that you could get a job. The best case scenario back then was you proved yourself such a good worker that you automatically got carried over to the next job. You know, the, that was the goal. And, and, and luckily that's what happened to me a few times. And, and the jobs lasted for long enough that I was able to stick with it for a while until I got injured. And then uh, I wasn't able to work anymore because it, it was pretty heavy lifting, you know. So, so al- although they would tell you if there's something that's over 70 pounds, get somebody else to help you. You didn't want to be the guy when there's dozens of people outside the fence line with their tools to stop another guy from working and be like, hey, can you help me do my job? Right. Because although they tell you, you know, get help, they're now they're possibly going to look at you as a burden. At least that's what was going through my mind. So I would lift stuff, you know, on my own that I probably shouldn't have. And I ended up making my herniated disc worse. And then uh, one morning before work, I was putting on my boots and I had already been noticing pretty bad back pain before that moment. But I was putting on my boots and I either coughed or sneezed and I felt something snap in my lower back and I got intense pain immediately. But I still made my way to the car, like limped my way over there, had about an hour commute up to Glendale. I was working on a Pixar Studios at that time. I was able to get out of the car, make it to the site. And then part of my job was to fill up the welding machines with gas. But when I picked up those two tanks of gas, five gallons in each one, and I went to stand up straight, I knew immediately that I couldn't do it. So I set the cans down and I went, you know, hobbled my ass over to the foreman. And I told him, hey, I I think I got to go home, you know, which is something you don't want to say at that time, you know, but I told him, hey, I think I got to go home. I didn't want to tell them that. I had hurt the back on the job site, you know, because I I can't wait for unemployment or any of that stuff. I was on paycheck to paycheck. So I told him, I think I just need to go home for the day. You know, I I think I tweaked something, but I'm pretty sure I could sleep it off. And he was like, oh, okay, go ahead. And by then the pain was getting horrible, you know, so I I actually limped my way slowly out, out of the job site just to the other side of the fence to where now the people in there couldn't see me. And then from that point, it actually took me a couple of hours to get to my car, which was just, you know, 75 feet away. Like I, I, I was leaning up against what I could and like the pain was excruciating. But I ended up making it to the car, driving back home, which was very painful in itself. And then I, I pretty much couldn't walk for close to a month after that. Whoa. But by being an iron worker for so long, I was able to get my credit score right. I wasn't able to to really save up money. I was still paycheck to paycheck, making enough to pay for a one bedroom apartment, my car, you know, and everything that comes with the insurance, gas, food. But uh, as soon as I could get up on crutches, I reconnected with a friend online who I'd see, you know, chat with at times at night. And he had always told me he was in marketing. I'd see him up at like 3 a.m. I'd be like, what do you do? You know, he's like marketing. (laughs) I'm like, what fucking marketer is up at fucking 3, 4 a.m.? So I asked him one day, hey, can I come down to your office? Uh, And he was like, sure. So I I headed over there, still on crutches. And and I sat with him in his office and and I saw him writing down. He he would get a text every now and again. I'd see him write down these numbers like 700, 350, 500. And then I told him, you know, what the hell are those numbers that you're writing down? He's like, that's how much money the company just made. I'm like, what the fuck? I was like, you're telling me that that was a $700 text message you just got? And he was like, yeah. I'm like, what kind of fucking marketing do you do? You know, and he's like, I do marketing for exotic dancers and escorts. 
And I'm like, what the fuck? So, you know, being injured, I kind of knew I'm not going to be able to get another construction job. So I had been kicking around the whole time. What am I going to do now for money? I didn't want to do crime again. In fact, even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be able to run away. (laughs) (laughs) I I was broken, you know, I was was crippled basically. So, yeah, it looked really bad. My, my, My back was like twisted to the left and hunched over. Uh, there was no curve in my lower back. It was like straight and in bad pain all the time being fed Norco and Vicodin by the doctors. They didn't want to fix it. They just wanted to give me more fucking pain pills. So I ended up asking my friend, I said, hey, if I was decide to try and do something like this, like, would you help me get started? And he was like, yeah, sure. And I don't think he believed me that I would actually be able to do it. He actually said other people have expressed interest in starting their own thing like this and they they never follow through. But I started picking his mind immediately. Like, so what do I do if this happens? If that happens, how do I deal with this problem if it arises? Advertising, you know, since I had nothing to do, I was on crutches. I would just chill with him at night and pick his brain. And I'd say w- within like a couple of weeks, I was ready to give it a shot. But first, I needed to, like, borrow money from anybody I could. So I borrowed money from my stepdad, from other iron workers I knew, told them that it was to make my car payment, you know, instead of telling them it's for some shot in the dark business venture. So I was able to scrape up probably just under two grand. But I had good enough credit that I got approved for a two thousand dollar credit line at, a, at an electronics store. So with the two grand, I was able to get an office, small one in, in L.A. in a pretty shady area. <laughs> but I was able to get an office. Uh, I was able to furnish it with a $2,000 credit card uh, at the electronics company. My friend ended up helping me from the beginning. So the first day I gave it a shot, I I made profit. And then it just continued from there. I stuck with it. And I did that for about nine years. So you were marketing um, exotic dancers and... I was doing marketing for them, for exotic dancers and escorts. I I guess the exotic dancers would end up being escorts if they went out on the calls because a majority of the calls that we would get or the leads that we would supply were were for companionship, which I guess would pertain more to the escorting element of it all. Probably 5% or less would actually be for exotic dancing because the way it was structured is that they would call the ad that we would have posted... Somebody would pick up the phone known as bookers. They would actually portray themselves as the girl in the ad and begin negotiations from there. So they would tell the girl that, hey, can you come over here and do a dance for me or for me and my friends? So if ever we got a call like that, we would just kind of make it available to anybody who wanted it. And then if people didn't want it because they, for example, didn't want to do any new dancing or anything like that, they would just reject it. And then we, you know, burn the call, basically move on to the next one. Gotcha. And you did that for, what did you say, nine years? Roughly nine years, yeah. This is going to sound ignorant on my part, but that's legal, right? Yeah, yeah. It's legal so long as you don't do anything you, you know, illegal, obviously. So we would get a ton of calls all the time where the client would be like, you know, hey, are you going to come over here and, in other words, engage in sexual activity for money? You know, and, and, and we would just pass on that call and take the next one. We would tell the girls that work with us, like, hey, look, dude, if you get caught doing anything like that, we're not going to work with you anymore, like at all. Because, again, you know, I had two strikes, so I wasn't willing to take that risk. You have to actually prove criminal intent, you know, like, like at trial, like reasonable doubt and all that. So I wasn't taking any chances. I wasn't trying to beat around the bush. Like, you know, I told girls straight up, if you do anything like that, you're not working with us anymore. And we actually caught people doing that and we'd get rid of them. And they would try desperately to come back to work with us because they knew we made a lot of money for them, which in turn made us money. But no, we didn't tolerate anything like that. And and we'd have people come in like during the hiring process and they would actually insist on being booked for calls like that after we would tell them like, hey, we don't do this here. And they'd be like, oh, you can book me for those calls. It would be like, no. You know, not here. (laughs) And if they kept pushing, they wouldn't pass the interview process and we wouldn't bring them on or work with them. So we were real firm on that. Like none of that was going to take place under our watch. Why did you stop that company? I needed to get the hell out of California. So that's when you moved to Tennessee? No, I knew I wanted to leave California. So so I left the company, I'd say back in March of 2021 when I was first considering leaving. And at that time I was looking around in like Texas and stuff like that. 
But yeah, I, I knew I didn't want to do that forever. And I had started getting a little better at trading stocks and cryptocurrency. So, you know, again, I didn't want to be in that industry forever. I figured I need to call it quits soon sure. so that that way I don't just end up trapped in it for another year. And then and then it turns into another year. And then here I am, I'm 50 years old in the escort industry and like already from the beginning, even having no bad intentions, trying to do everything right. Being in that industry, you're automatically lumped up with the slime balls, you know, because there are sure. plenty of those slime balls out there. What? You would see news articles all the time. Uh, me being in charge of hiring, I would hear the stories from girls who would come from other companies. I say companies, air quotes, because they're essentially just slime balls that found a desk. And they would tell us how they operated, you know, and, and we offered them an escape from that type of environment where the owners were pressuring them for like, you know, sex and stuff like that, encouraging them to do illegal activities. It was like the complete opposite at our company. Like I never even wanted to fucking interact with them, you know, with the girls. Like I, I was just like, look, I'm going to be at the office. I'm going to make you money. And it's as simple as that. Don't do anything illegal. You do something illegal. You don't work here anymore. You know, so it was it was refreshing to them, in my opinion. But anywho, I, I was already lumped up with that. I knew like as far as in the public eye, because what most people know about the industry is what they see in movies or, you know, how they portray them and all that. So I haven't wanted to do that for I'd say it was probably a couple of years before I actually ended up leaving. And then I finally just made my move in March of 2021. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to focus more on Bitcoin. I'm going to focus more on trading stocks and then Web 3.0, you know, the metaverse. I'm diving real deep into that now. The house that I was able to get in East Tennessee was from crypto profits, you know, from Ethereum, from Dogecoin. So it's been working out well so far. Sure. So which crypto do you trade? All of them? Right now, I'm I'm more or less stuck in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, and Mana, which is a cryptocurrency that's tied to a metaverse that's called Decentraland. You can find it on Decentraland.org. I've bought digital real estate within that metaverse and learned how to build in it. So you can essentially build yourself a 3D website, like say you own a business or a product or whatever. You can build a structure on your plot of land in this metaverse and the users are actually able to land in it with their avatars, multiple users, and then they can in turn interact with each other and navigate your structure or 3D website, however you want to look at it. And you can have links to where the avatar walks up to it. It'll inform them like, hey, this is a link. You know, this is where it's going to direct you to if you click. So I bought digital real estate. I built on it, monetized it with like links for my books and stuff like that. And then uh, providing other services on that parcel where like people can host their NFTs, non-fungible tokens, like for their launch parties, if they release an NFT and they want to do a party in the metaverse, which is, you know, right up the alley of NFTs, basically a parcel in the metaverse is in itself an NFT. So it's, it's related. So if somebody wants to do a launch party for their product, they can use my parcel or gallery or 3D website, you know, again, however you'd like to view it. So that's one way I'm investing in the metaverse. And then, yeah, when it comes to crypto and stocks, I'll, I'll just trade them, you know, using charts and limit sales and all that good stuff. Sure. And that seems to be uh, working out. That's your only job right now is all of that shit. Yeah, it's my only job. I, I mean, it has its ups and its downs. Like today is a down. <laughs> you know, I was looking at the charts just before we started the podcast and I was like, Jesus Christ, today's a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> you get that too, but then you'll have your good days where it makes up for the previous day's losses and some, you know. Sure. The second book is called Up on Game. When I Ruled the World. All right. Now, what is that book about? And does Mike Dawson voice the audiobook? Up on Game, When I Ruled the World is more or less an expansion on the first book. When I wrote the first book, I was concerned about statute of limitations on certain crimes. So I couldn't dive too deep into certain things. In the first book, when I began discussing my time in prison, I left a lot of stuff out, you know, again, because of statute of limitations me having two strikes and not wanting to like put my foot in my mouth. Basically, once I figured I didn't have to worry about those anymore, I expanded a little bit. So basically, I hit prison when I was 19 years old. By the time I was 23, 
I was asked to be what some people in the movies might describe as, as a shot caller, right? For the prison gang that I was a, a part of. That was pretty much what I left out in the first book, you know? So I went a little deeper into it in the second book, explained the process of how it worked out, you know, like how one might find themselves in that situation. And again, the reason I also did that was to show people that are in that environment currently, like, look, this is what I've been through. You know, if, if they're in California and, and they've been in the prison system since, you know, 2002, they've probably heard of me. No one had high expectations for me back then. Not even myself. Even when I got out of prison, I, I was telling people, see you later versus bye. You know, I was like, I'll be back in a few months. Like, I'm certain of it. You know, I did not expect to stay out. So I want people that are stuck in that environment to see you know, that, hey, I've been through what you're going through, if not worse. And in some cases, maybe it's not even close to what they've been through, but they can still relate to it in a way, you know, and see that, hey, look, I got out. I view the world differently now. Like, I'm not all about that gangster life. They call it your criminal career. Like, I'm not worried about continuing my criminal career. Like, I'm willing to let it go. And with a lot of people, that's all they have. They're really that deep in the criminal element that their criminal reputation, their criminal career is all they have, you know, so it's hard for them to let that go and explore something else because they figure if I end up having to fall back on my criminal career, people are going to wonder what happened in that window, you know, kind of like if you go unemployed for a certain amount of years. And then you apply somewhere else and they're like, oh, I noticed that, you know, there's a gap here in your employment history. Like it's kind of looked that funny. It's the same thing in the criminal world. Like if you just drop off the face of the earth to explore real estate, let's say for a few years, everyone's automatically going to assume, did you get in trouble? You know, did you get arrested or are you like an undercover informant now or some shit? So it's actually a big step for a lot of people to take. You know, they figure if I turn my back on that criminal world completely and try something else for any extended amount of time, but then end up going back to the criminal world, people aren't going to trust me anymore. You know, so a lot of people won't take the step because of that. That makes sense. Yeah, in a way, you know, I mean, it's, it's real frustrating. Like when you when I think about that world, like it's real hard to help people that are stuck in that still because. It's, it's what you're surrounded with. It's what you grew up with since you were a kid. You don't know anything else. So would it be safe to say that the first book is how you got to prison and the second book is your time in prison? No, I'd say the second half of the first book is about prison, too. And then the second book is just all about prison, but where I explain that I was actually the shot caller and or so the correctional officers would say with their language. And I tell different stories like that I experienced. So certain stories that I didn't include in the first book, I included in the second. But again, like for your listeners, if they were considering reading the book, even if they're not in that element, like it's nothing they have to concern themselves with, I'm sure they'd still enjoy the ride. Sure. Is Mike Dawson doing the second audiobook? Yeah, he's already done it. It's released. Oh, cool. Available on Audible. Are there paper versions, like physical copies of both books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Amazon, yep. All right, rock on. Do you have a website? Yes, it's called upongamebook.com. Sweet. Wow. I feel like we could talk for another hour because I have so many more questions. <laughs> yeah. But I think we're, I'm going to have to cut it here, man. <laughs> That's all right with me. Oh, Richard Stanley. This has been enlightening to say the least and humorous way funnier than i thought it was going to be <laughs> <laughs> where can people find you on social media i'm mostly on twitter at up on gamebook same handle on instagram but again mostly on twitter and then decentraland.org if they're considering you know diving into the metaverse i'm on there more than i am twitter so if you go to decentraland.org and you go to coordinates 59 negative 139 they can see me there so the coordinates 59 negative 139 is essentially getting them to that 3d website or structure i was telling you about uh, and they can find different podcasts i've done links to the audible books they can find me there so they can interact with me with their avatars but yeah i'm a big fan of decentraland <laughs> and again that coordinate is 59 negative 139 59 negative 139 is kind of the address to your gallery in that universe. Yep. Wow. 
that's mind bending. Um, <laughs> before I let you go, is there anything we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about today? I mean, maybe we could get into all that on the next one. Deal. We can talk about the vice doc and the ceiling tiles in prison and oh, yeah. justice yes. versus rehabilitation and what the hell is the green wall? I got it. We could talk about all of that when you come back, all right? Yep. The escape from prison, all that stuff. Escape? Yep. Oh, dot, 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 listeners, streetwalkers, if you will. That's one of the things I expanded on in my second book. Wow. Prison escape. All right, guys, you heard him. He's coming back. We're going to talk about all that crazy shit. Richard Stanley, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your weird ass metaverse to hang out and let us get to know you a little bit better, man. I appreciate it. No problem, man. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. My pleasure. And you have a great rest of your day, man. You too. Thank you. All right. Peace. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2001 album Intransigence, used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is from the song Say My Name off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems, used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening. <laughs>